This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I was trying to get an idea. I want them dead presidents. I want to pull up. Head spin. Get it, get it flat. I got six jobs. I don't get it. And welcome in to episode number nine of Two Bad Hombres. I am your host, Vito Jerome Chirk. I forgot to do the uh, Jerome. Jerome on Tiger's Talk this week. Anyways, I am joined as usual by my sidekick, my partner in crime, the president, uh, the co founder, co CEO, whatever you want to call him, the podfather from Doc and Jock. That is John Macaroon. John, how's it going? Looking forward to the weekend, Vito. Looking forward to a conversation with you about the week that was. What an interesting week. I know you got a lot to talk about. The rundown sheet here is amazing. What's on your mind, sir? Well, Doc, what we have to really get into first and foremost, I think, is the Oscars flub that happened with the Best Picture Award. We saw the envelope not be the right one that was delivered to the presenters that went up there to present Best Picture. Instead, it was the Best Actress Award. The envelope for that, which, you know, read Emma Stone from La La Land. Guess what? Best Picture was not received by La La Land. Instead, by the movie Moonlight. And the thing is, well, everybody for a few seconds, a moment at least, thought, well, that La La Land had officially won Best Picture at the Oscars this year. And then things just went to, you know, just hit the wall. The stuff hit the fan because then you had these people from the Academy, producers and everything, uh, stage managers, have to deal with this issue and get it rectified. Well, it took too long. I think, to get it rectified, too, which made it even worse. And if you would have seen the reaction of the actors and actresses in the crowd when they realized that La La Land really had not won Best Picture, it was pretty devastating, incredible, historic, the biggest flub in Oscars history by far. Now, Vito, when I sit and watch the Oscars, I get excited. You know, I'm a big fan of Jimmy Kimmel, like I told you. But when you realize what's going on with the ratings, the ratings have been dipping year after year. And unfortunately, even Jimmy Kimmel was not able to save the ratings. They were even down from the year before with the host being Chris Rock. And then I asked myself, why are the ratings continue to dip? Well, number one, the show is far too long. Nobody really cares in the population regarding the sound editors, the cinematographers. There are so many awards that are given out right in the middle of the show that make it so hard to watch. And like you told me in our pre-show meeting, you fell asleep. You didn't I see did. It. Because the show is too long. If you DVR'd it, if you didn't hit the extra 30-minute button, it would have erased. You would have not have seen the flub because the show is so long. It went even after midnight. So the way it went down was you thought that, uh, you know, people were like, why are, why do they have the presenters being a little bit older in Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway? And, you know, Warren Beatty goes to the card. He kind of looks and pauses. I thought he was trying to be funny. He then is, is befuddled. He like <laughs> shoves the card right to Faye Dunaway. He gave the grenade right to, to Faye Dunaway, she definitely. Looks, she looks at it and is like, la la land. And it's like, okay. And then once everyone realized what was going on, it was, like you said, it was definitely an unorganized situation. Jimmy Kimmel looked really devastated, looked like, oh, no, we definitely ruined something. He tried to make light of it. But in essence, what they got to do, and I tell my wife every year we sit and watch it because we flip around, we skip the middle parts because there's really five or six awards you really want to see, and there's the the pomp and circumstance. So you got to cut it down to a two-hour show, and then you got to do like six, seven awards only, a couple musical performances, and then, you know, the comedy, and that's it. Two hours max. Going into three and a half, four hours, you're not going to get the ratings. I know it's still a lot of people at 32 million people watched the Oscars, but in essence, when I look at it, it's too long. And then, Vito, there's another thing, too. It's a liberal crowd. And, Vito, what have the liberals been doing? They've been bashing the president. And so I really believe that there are some people who are turned off by the liberal actors, and they're trying to act like, oh, you know, we're you know influencers. We're those, we have the right to make speeches about politics. And I do believe, whether it be a small segment, maybe just a couple points in ratings, but I do believe if these actors would not make political speeches at these things, then I do think the ratings would be higher. So there is an impact 
for these liberal actors going out there and spewing all these things that they talk about because you are turning off a segment of the population. Because what was the highest rated? I believe it was 1998 when Titanic won. Darn near 55 million people tuned in to that Oscars. But every year since, it's just been dipping, and the ratings are down because it's just a too long of a show. And that blunder actually made news. It was kind of funny. Was it meant? Now there is that conspiracy theory about Jimmy Kimmel, the Academy, being in on it. No way. No way that they And you saw the Academy blame, by the way, that Price Waterhouse Coopers, which is, uh, you know, the accounting firm, this multi-service firm that's all throughout the world that handles, uh, you know, auditing. It handles supposedly a tax and consulting services and the resolving of complex issues, which I really laugh at. Now, the resolving of complex issues is one of the main things on its website that it says this Price Waterhouse Coopers, you know, firm handles. Well, they have a major issue to resolve and to handle right now, and they're blaming it all on the one accountant. Did you see that, too? Whose name is Brian Colonin? They got a name, huh? There's a name to drop right there. So they're blaming it on him because there's two accountants, by the way. I believe the other name is Martha Ruiz, a woman, and then the man is Brian Cullinan. These two individuals responsible for handling the envelopes that have the award winners for all the awards throughout the Oscars. And then, you know, it's befuddling because they're responsible for this. And this Price Waterhouse Coopers, which has handled the Academy Awards for all these years, has never messed up. You know, never been a big gaffe like this. Nobody has ever noticed anything. Then they mess up. It's like of epic proportions, too, because it's for the best picture award, the biggest award, the last award of the night. I mean, and you screw up with that. And then this colon, it also is coming under scrutiny because there was a tweet he posted on his own Twitter moments uh, before the award was announced. And it was announced, you know, in a screwed up fashion as La La Land. Well, moments before that, he took a photo of Emma Stone, you know, tweeting out that she had won Best Actress with the hashtag PWC for PricewaterhouseCoopers. So he was kind of hanging out in the back, fooling around, lost track. So it looks even worse for this guy now. I mean, how much do we take into account that maybe he was sidetracked by Emma Stone, her beauty, her elegance, and just being starstruck by Emma and taking that photo of her and then posting it on his own Twitter feed? And he got rid of that tweet, by the way, like immediately after all this came under fire with the misconstruing of the award, obviously, that was Best Picture. What is interesting is, and what I've talked to Adam about in several podcasts on Doc and Jock, is the notion, Vito, that, you know, in some situations, many people don't do their job very well. And when you have a situation where you got two envelopes to double check everything, why is it so complicated? In that situation, Vito, they need a foolproof system. You cannot have it. And there was one instance way back in the day with Sammy Davis where he actually they grabbed, did, yeah, they he grabbed the up. wrong card and things like that. It wasn't actually read, though. In this situation nowadays, though, with the accounting firm Price Waterhouse Cooper, they needed to definitely make sure that things were going to run smooth. And it just, it just didn't happen. People make mistakes, but... You know, Vito, it could have been a situation that was mitigated and taken care of. Once Warren Beatty gets out there, he opens the card. Why does he go? Why does he look and pause? Just go into the microphone and just announce, I have this card. It says Emma Stone on it. That's it. Then someone would have rushed on stage. It would have been given to him, and the problem would have been resolved. But, you know, Vito, when you have 100 million people watching or 200 million worldwide, you get a little bit flustered. So it's easier said than done, but it's one of those things where, you know, I think Warren Beatty could have did a, maybe a little bit of a better job had he handled it and just said, he could have just read the card. Said, the, this card reads Emma Stone. <laughs> la, 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 and it looks even more idiotic because he didn't know what to do. That's why he paused it because, like you said, people thought he was trying to be funny, Warren Beatty, and it was a misfire at his attempt to be funny. Well, it wasn't truly because of that. But this guy, Brian Cullinan, and his sidekick from PWC, why didn't they go up to handle the situation more aptly, you know, more in an adequate, timely fashion. They didn't even take protocol or be proactive about this situation until everything just hit the fan. When they knew they had, you know, a misfire and a truly epically, you know, true epically bad situation on their hands. They didn't do anything until that was the case when La La Land, all its directors, producers, actors, actresses were already up on the stage to receive the Best Picture Award. So Cullinan is coming under fire, too, and his partner should, too, as well from PWC for not really handling this situation proactively, you know, in a timely fashion, because they could have gone right up to Warren Beatty to end this right then and there. And to get right to Moonlight winning instead of it being announced as a La La Land winning. So 
We can't blame really Warren Beatty and his sidekick presenter there and Faye Dunaway too much because it's on Price Waterhouse Coopers, who didn't come out right a way to apologize. And I know the Academy did not like that whatsoever either. But now this Mr. Brian Cullinan will never have his image be totally rectified or where it was before this edition of the Academy Awards, and he'll never live it down to uh, say the least. But I wanted to ask you, you know, in any fashion whatsoever, are we blowing this controversial envelope gate now as it's being labeled out of proportion at all, Doc? Or was this mishandling worthy of all this attention, truly? Because it was Best Picture, too. The largest, you know, the most notable award of the entire Oscars. It's not being blown out of proportion, Vito, because it's an important thing because you are now affecting people's lives and their livelihoods, too, because those producers of that movie, La La Land, lost a lot of money by not having that movie being called the best picture of the year. Because, you know, once you're part of a best picture, then you have further opportunities. You have maybe the the ability to get more work. So the utter embarrassment to have that happen is unbelievable. And it's just one of those things, too, to the movie that won. That's not the way you want to win. You want to have the full ability to go up there and celebrate and talk. And it's just one of those things. You can't do that. You can't do that to people. And it's unfortunate. It was a flub. You know, people tried to make light of it, but in essence, if it was me, I wouldn't have been as gracious as that producer from La La Land. He was unbelievably gracious, and it's one of those things where I couldn't do it. I would have been livid. I would have walked off the stage with the Oscar. They would have had to come pride out of my hands, because you announced me the winner. That makes it so. And then once you would have heard that Moonlight actually won, you would have thrown that Oscar as far as you could have thrown it to break that Oscar award, the, the trophy itself. You would have, wouldn't you have? I would have been pissed, dude, because, you know— A lot of people would have. I would have been livid, because it's one of those things where, Vito, it's not right. It's not— you rehearse it. There's rehearsals beforehand. There are situations where you practice what you're doing. How do you not get Warren Beatty the proper envelope? It's a disgrace. It's really, it is one of those things where in the next five or six years, we'll look back at it and laugh. But right now, ooh, I'd be livid. I would be mad. Woo. Brian Cullinan, his name, this guy from Price Waterhouse Coopers will live in infamy. And this is an infamous gaffe that really sparked some people on Twitter coming out and tweeting out some funny stuff, including Billy Crystal. Did you see his tweet? What it read? Now, he mocked that infamous gaffe by tweeting out, amazing ending. Wish that it happened on election day. Well, we know who he voted for. There's a little political stance taken there, which you don't stand for yourself. I know you don't like that the liberals are attacking you and your your conservative ways and viewpoint stock. I just know you're not for that on or in an award show. You don't want all that or that to be sparked from an award show. But the way in which that gaffe, you know, it spiraled out of control. That's why it's called a gaffe now. It's an infamous gaffe. I think the way in which all of that was handled and then how everybody reacted to it, well, it was going to lead to stuff like that from other celebrities. And I think rightfully so. I think it was funny, too, what Billy Crystal tweeted out. And then there was a GIF. By the way, I looked up, you know, GIF, those, they're called GIFs, by the way. They're not GIFs. I looked it up for the proper enunciation. So we know that now as well. And hopefully all you guys are learning something from Two Bad Hombres this week because of that. And there was this one that circulated of a President Trump executive order, which in the GIF read, La La Moon wins. He held up, you know, a sign for the executive order. And on this, I I think it was like a piece of paper or whatever, you know, had his executive order and it read the executive order. So instead of that executive order, it read La La Moon wins. And that's like an infamous gif right there, like an all timer, I think. Because of this spiraling out of control on, you know, behalf of the Academy, you know what? We got some good stuff on Twitter. Because the interweb man took it, ran with it, and it went wild. It really did, to say the least, Doc. It is one of those things that is going to live in infamy. It's probably one of the most uncomfortable live moments. I watched it live, and you almost had to if you had a DVR, because I didn't even know that it wasn't Warren Beatty that said it. It was Faye Dunaway. Faye Dunaway actually did say it, and I didn't see it. Like you said, I wasn't watching it live. But how about the reactions? I think you wanted to get into that, too. You know, to sag totally into that. The Rock. Did you see his face? I saw now the image of him after the fact and the other celebrities, actresses, actors in the crowd, how they reacted to that moment. They were utterly stunned. Because they all realized, like, what's going on? Is this a joke? What, what was going on? The situation was so chaotic. And you had, you know, Jimmy Kimmel come out on the mic and try to defuse it. But once Warren Beatty got on the mic 
and had said, like, I wasn't trying to be funny here. I was trying to actually say the name. But uh, the moment that really sticks with me is the producer kind of ripping the card out of Warren Beatty's hand. Like, he looks at it, he grabs it, and just kind of goes here. And, it, and you could see that was probably the one moment where he was a little bit, you know, curt or a little bit hasty. Tense, maybe a jerk even? No, because I know he wanted to really, really emphasize to the people because it was a moment where you could. He knew he was going to be, this was a moment probably he realized, oh boy, this is a moment that probably is going to live in infamy. And he was able to kind of, you know, stamp it. What's the picture that's going around? Is him holding the card up? you know, in, in front of these in, entire crowd. So it is just one of those things where you cannot, you have to in a production like that with so many people watching, you got to make it easy. You got to make sure that Warren Beatty has the proper card no matter what. So there's going to be jokes made in coming years. But for me, I hope Jimmy Kimmel has the opportunity to do it again. He was excellent. The whole show was funny. And uh, I hope you realize too, Adam Carolla was writing some of the jokes beforehand. Jimmy Kimmel's a loyal guy in that he had an opportunity, so he brought along his boys, his writers that were comedians, and many people said, hey, man, this is one of the funniest shows ever. You had the whole situation with those that were on the bus coming in, taking pictures. You know, Gary from Chicago is a new famous individual. You made stars. It was fun. There were things to talk about. It was a fun Oscars, one that I would like to watch again, but you just can't have a show in this day and age in lieu of what people are doing on a weekend night to have a show go from 8.30 to damn near 12.15 in the morning. you got to cut the show down to two, three hours max, and that's it because it's just too long. The ratings are going to decline. You could have... You know, bring you could even bring back Billy Crystal, bring back Ellen. The ratings are going to Whoopi dip. Goldberg, baby. She's done it before too. You got. How about my girl, my home girl, Whoopi? Just give the the other people in those lower categories their own show on the side and let them get their awards and stuff like that. But the main show should just be supporting actor, actress, best song, best director, best movie, best actor, actress, and really about that's about it. Six to eight categories. Two hours, play all the songs, do the nice 10, 15 minute monologue, and get in and out. Two hours, man. I, I would get that thing. I would get the ratings up to at least 40 million in three years. No, no doubt about it, because it's too long and it's too a little bit too political. And and what what people don't like, people don't like when the music plays, when you have a situation where when it's someone's crowning achievement and you're damn near playing orchestra music to get them off. You got people, you know, talking about thanking their mother, thanking people that are important to them, you're playing them off. And did you see the the biggest gaffe, too, in terms of the in-memoriam section? They put the photo of a woman that was actually alive. They got the name right of the woman who passed away, but they flashed the photo of a woman who was really alive. Could you imagine you're sitting there watching, having some popcorn, and all of a sudden your picture shows up, and people are like, oh, my God, your friends, family might be thinking, wait a minute, I just saw her a couple hours ago. She's dead? <laughs> <You can't." laughs> what happened to her? Yeah. But hey, but hey maybe instead of... Uh, you know, focusing so much on the, the political jokes, they could focus on tightening up their ship production-wise. Which, uh, you know, some people have tweeted out that uh, Donald Trump two years ago had tweeted, like, what kind of production is this fading fast? He had tweeted out. Oh, so now he's right. He saw the writing on the wall, saw it coming, saw the crap storm that would ensue from this year's rendition of the Academy Awards. You know what's funny, though, is that the ratings might have been helped out for as paltry they were you know, they might have been helped out by that moment, the infamous gaffe. Don't you think so, that that really helped out, that it helped bring the Oscars this year to attention worldwide? Without that moment, would as many people, well, we already know the actually answer to this question, not as many people would have been talking about the Oscars this year. So they got, what, 32 million people and viewers for this year's awards, and maybe they're going downhill, will continue to go downhill, but the point is, without that moment, it might not have even been 32 million people. And maybe people wouldn't have been talking about it at the water cooler the next day, or this the entirety of this past week as much as they did, if it wasn't for that infamous gaffe. And the thing is, what they have to curtail, really tidy up, is the length, as you said. And the envelope gate that ensued. I mean, it's funny because they had duplicate copies, two you know, separate envelopes with the name of the award winner for each award. So how do you get it wrong when you have two copies? And now the question is, you got two questions on your hands. If you're the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, it's about tidying up the duration of this award show to lessen the length of it, obviously. But also, what do you do now with the duplicate copies of these envelopes? Do you get rid of that? Do you alter the process, alter the system to prevent another award miscue from happening? So you got those two questions. What would you do with the length? What would you do to, to lessen the length of the show itself, but then also about the envelope situation to you know prevent 
another gaffe from happening in the future with an award. No doubt about it is maybe you make the envelopes bigger. You potentially have the cards turned over so that no matter what, when you announce it, you don't just read it. You just uh, announce it and then turn it over so that people can see. That's all. People want proof that that's the actual card is that the, the procedure is you go out there, you read the card, and then you turn it over and you go from there. But to have multiple cards, maybe I wouldn't do that. I would maybe just have one and just have one person that you assign to take care of it with maybe a backup person to double check that the card that's being given is the right one. And that's what you do. So I would make it a two hour show. You, I told you the reasons why I would shorten it. And then what you do is you, you have to make it less complicated. You cannot have a gaff. You know, if you only have one card, then you, you're only in a situation where the person who's going to present it gets that card and that's it. And one person may be allocated to get the card from the uh, allocated spot to the presenter. They rehearse it. I mean, what are they rehearsing? You know, you how do you rehearse that and not get it in that situation? So it'll be corrected. You probably won't see a moment like that for quite a while because maybe it, ever again, right? Yeah. So it's one of those things where it's an embarrassing kind of thing. But hey, it'll be corrected, and in future years, people will make light of it, and uh, we go forward, man. Now, does this blunder help out Jimmy Kimmel's career at all? Does it? No, dude. No, it, not like get no. more people interested in what he's doing with his own show on no. ABC? Dude, he's a social media king. He knows what he's doing already. It only elevated him because the show came off great. Many people are reviewing him to be positive. He did a great job, so he's just going to continue to carry on. Hopefully, he gets more opportunities, but he is one of the top five entertainers in the world, and no doubt about it. He's hardworking, and his, his stuff is funny. The ideas that were presented were really good. I didn't see too many jokes that fell flat. I, I love the entire production. I liked what he did. I liked what he brought. And I liked the fact that he included, you know, his boy in the writing. So it was all good on my part. I liked it. I liked Jimmy Kimmel and everything that he did. I thought it was, it was, I thought it was hilarious. Even when he walked up to Warren Beatty, he was like, Warren, what did you do? <laughs> it was good. It was good stuff. He tried to play it off as much as possible. And he was great all throughout the night. And, you know, like you said, he really displayed a lot of integral elements from his own show. Mixed those in. And by incorporating all that, he made it a great show, a great hosting job, for sure, by Jimmy Kimmel. Now, can we say that Richard Hamilton now, was he great enough to be a Pistons Hall of Famer, as he now is? His number 32 jersey was raised to the rafters at the Palace in the last year of the Palace being used as a Pistons home site, which is funny. They put up the... You know, they put up his jersey number to the rafters at the Palace, and now they got to take it down and move it to Little Caesars Arena in time for next season. Kind of funny in that regard. But the point of this discussion, my question for you, Doc, is do you think Richard Hamilton, Richard Rip, yes, sir, Hamilton, was worthy of that Hall of Fame induction last Sunday? Well, in essence, the way I look at it, I'm a capitalist. I understand why Tom Gores did it. It was a money grab, but it does lessen the award. Number 32 should not be synonymous with Richard Hamilton for the Pistons. He was great, but his numbers don't dictate that he should have his number retired. I think everybody knows it. It was one of those things where you look at it and you say, the Pistons are trying to honor the 2004 team. They already put Ben and Chauncey up there. They wanted to have another celebration, so they honored Rip Hamilton. But the part that really is interesting to talk about and look at is Rip Hamilton burned some bridges with the Pistons. It wasn't like he was, and his speech was utterly hilarious, and then he comes out, he's like, I was taught by so many people to stay humble. I was taught by so many people to be cool and to handle yourself professionally. And then on the you juxtapose that with the reports and rumors that come out that, you know, he really was really upset with Joe Dumars. He orchestrated that whole walkout under John Kuster. It was one of those things where the tenure of Richard Hamilton in Detroit ended poorly. And it was one of those things where Richard Hamilton did not kind of lead by example at the end of his career. He you have to realize it's a business. And at any point in time, the general manager may fib to you. He was livid that he signed a contract and then Chauncey was traded off and that he kind of felt locked in and he felt betrayed by Joe Dumars and the organization. And then he kind of fell out of favor with John Kuster and he organized a couple guys to not show up for a practice, you know, ahead of a game versus the 76ers, I believe. So that's not a situation where you really want to honor somebody because, yeah, you can forgive them, but the example that that set and the power move that he tried to make was such, you know, really over the top and unprofessional. But in the end, when you look at it, everybody agrees. Richard Rip Hamilton, number 32, probably not deserved to be up there. But they did it, and they enjoyed it, and it does mean a lot to these athletes. I get it. But jersey retirement numbers should be sacred. And you would think maybe at most the Pistons should have maybe two to four at most. Now you have to maybe then think, well, then why not add Sheed? Why not add somebody else? 
Well, so. if you had anybody else, okay, Rashid Wallace. How about Tayshaun Prince, the Prince of the Palace? Should never be added. I don't think Rashid should be either. And people love him for his antics, for who he is as a person off the basketball court, too. And if you ever watch now TNT, it's called Area 21 with Kevin Garnett. Rashid Wallace is a sidekick for this new sketch and studio they have set up for Kevin Garnett. It's great to see those guys going at it together. Rashid is such a fun, loving personality. And to see what's going to come out of his mouth. I mean, he was always a great soundbite. Thing is, with all these guys, even Rip Hamilton was at times. But was he deserving of that Jersey retirement? I don't think so either. So we can't even disagree here to make this fun and some fun-loving banter between you and I. Because we have the same side of the argument. We're taking the side that he doesn't deserve to have his Jersey retired like it was last Sunday. And I think it comes down to two guys for me that deserve to be enshrined into the Pistons Hall of Fame from that 4 championship team. For me, Chauncey Billups as a true floor general, obviously, at the point guard position, and Mr. Big Shot, making many clutch shots throughout his career and being deserving of that nickname, Mr. Big Shot. And also Big Ben Wallace. He was the defensive anchor, and the defense was the M.O., was a calling card of those teams that made the six straight Eastern Conference Finals appearances, made two straight Finals appearances, won it all in 4 against the Lakers in five games. Big Ben anchored that defense, won multiple Defensive Player of the Year awards. And you can argue right now very well that Ben Wallace deserves to be enshrined into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Not just the Pistons Hall of Fame, but the Basketball Hall of Fame. And Chauncey Big Shot Billups probably won't, probably doesn't deserve to, but he was a true leader floor general of that team. For me, with him making big shots too in countless games, regular season, postseason games, Chauncey deserves to have his number like it was retired. Ben Wallace, same thing. Those two guys deserve to have their jersey numbers retired. And in Pistons lore and be a part, those two guys, to be a part of the Pistons Hall of Fame, very deserving of it. But Rip Hamilton, just not as much, despite the fact that he wore that face mask glowingly. You know, that was great. He made that a part of who he was on the basketball floor every night. He went out there and was a member of the Pistons. And also coming off of curls and knocking down that mid-range jumper, which is like a thing of the past now in today's NBA, where everything's about the three ball and the Golden State Warriors and the Splash Brothers and draining those threes at an efficient rate. That's like the way to win nowadays. The mid-range jumper... That that shot that Rip truly perfected as a Piston is like long lost. It's not even a, a thing anymore. So you got to give him credit for all of that, for knocking down those shots at a very efficient rate, you know, being really a guy that could light it up. When he got going, he could light it up and have a 20, 30-plus point game. And you know what? He produced some of the best uh, point totals in Piston's history. And he was kind of... he. he Besides for Chauncey, you could say he was the go-to guy offensively on those Pistons teams. And on some nights, and you probably can look at their six straight trips to the Eastern Conference Finals. In some of those seasons, Rip was more the go-to guy scoring the basketball. And if he didn't average the most points per game on those teams, he was second right behind Chauncey. So him and uh, Rip, and I think Rip actually led the team in scoring uh, more than Chauncey, maybe even during all six of those trips the Pistons had of the Eastern Conference Finals during one of the greatest eras for basketball in Detroit Pistons history. But still, with all that being said, I know I just brought up why he was beloved as a Piston and how he could score the basketball at a premium rate. Still, I think you don't want to retire all these numbers because then it becomes too much of a trend. Then you have to retire maybe Rashid's number, maybe Tayshaun's number, two guys that aren't even close to being deserving of that honor. And then my other beef with all of this is that, well, not only that the Pistons are retiring too many jerseys, I mean, they retired Vinny Johnson's. Remember that? A guy that came off the bench when they won the back-to-back championships as the bad boys. Still, he didn't deserve to have his jersey number retired either. And Rip is right in that boat a little bit better. Obviously, Rip was a starter on all these teams that we already talked about. So more in the upper echelon of Pistons greats. And you could still consider him as one of the greatest Pistons of all time. But by having him get his jersey retired, then it leads to potentially, once again, Rashid, to Tayshaun getting their numbers retired. And those guys shouldn't even have a say in the conversation, should not even have their names mentioned in the same conversation as, well, Chauncey or Big Ben, and really, to a large degree, even Rip. So Rip is the first of the guys honored from the 04 team, that championship squad in 04, that really doesn't deserve to have had his jersey number retired. And as you said, Doc, you pinpointed it yourself already. The way in which he exited Motown, 
it wasn't very professional. He wasn't always the most professional in his career, in his stint with the Pistons. So for me, the way in which he went out as well and burned some bridges with the Pistons franchise, for me, all those things have to be taken into account. And those, all of this stuff that I just talked about, it all adds up to why Rip should have never had his jersey number retired. And, and then the other part, the final part, is he thanked everybody. Yep. He literally thanked 250 people, but he didn't thank Joe Dumars. Well, I was going to actually talk about that, too. It segs right into my next point. Why wasn't Joe D there? The he team hasn't president? Been to any of he hasn't been to any of them. Because of the fact he was fired, he was let go unceremoniously, probably felt like he probably needed to keep his job longer because of the things that he did. But when Joe Dumars fell out of favor with the organization, it's one of those things where he's yet to return and I think that it kind of went south pretty quick because the, re- the rebuild is hard. It's, it's one of those things where the first go around, you have an opportunity to build a team, but to deconstruct a team and put it back together was something that became very hard. And there were se- several draft picks that you look at with Joe Dumars that you go, he mismanaged the draft. You know, obviously, the, one of the biggest busts in all of the NBA history was the Darko pick. Now, you won the, the NBA title the year that he was drafted, and you didn't need him, but... You could have had Carmelo Anthony. You could have had Dwayne Wade. You could have had a situation where instead of just winning that one title, you could have won multiple titles. You might have had those six years where you got to the Eastern Conference Finals consecutively. You might have been able to knock down two or three titles. You imagine having Chauncey you know, and Dwayne Wade. You have a situation where you could have had a dynasty for a decade. Where's Rip then? Where's the room for Rip? He would have complained about that too. Remember they tried having him come off the bench there. Remember him and AI? They didn't mesh at all. And that was a trade orchestrated to get Allen Iverson by Joe Dumars, the former team president and general manager. But do you know another move, big one, notable one that was orchestrated by Joe Dumars? That the Pistons team needed to win a championship in 04? The Rasheed Wallace trade. Rasheed would not have been a member of the Pistons without Joe Dumars orchestrating that move. And getting Big Ben Wallace, all these notable guys that became and maybe starters. A lot of fans feel like he deconstructed too early. Maybe you could have got another run out of him if you maybe you know had some solid draft picks. But you know, I don't think a lot of people favored ch- trading Chauncey Billups for Allen Iverson. Well, and then for the trade, because Allen Iverson was kind of washed up, at least during the end of his career, was no longer an all-star performer. Joe Dumars, though, in his defense, tried to change things up. And Rip Hamilton even came out and advocated that and an interview with the newspapers leading up to that Jersey retirement ceremony last Sunday. He had brought that up himself that, you know, he can see why Joe Dumars started that rebuild. But you're right. If they didn't draft Darko and would have drafted Carmelo, let's say, if they would have had him instead of Darko Milicek, well, that would have fast-forwarded the rebuild. And maybe there would not have been a true rebuild the Pistons would have had to endure through. If that would have been the case, the Pistons would have been relevant for a longer period of time and maybe would have snuck out another NBA championship. You're right about that, Doc. Very good point. Got to give it to you as a podfather here and bow down to you a little bit. But the other thing is, they could have easily won in 05 if Rashid would have guarded Robert Ori. Remember that, too. So they should have won back-to-back championships with the team that Joe Dumars put together. So let me ask you this. If they would have won back-to-back titles with that team, would Joe Dumars have been welcome back? He might have won a couple more times. should have been. Yeah, it's one of those things where you look at it and you say, well... You know, what is Joe Dumars' current standing with the ownership? Is he uh, totally upset with the organization? Has he been invited and then turned it down? Has he not been invited at all? It is, though, really, it's upsetting when you look at it, when everyone's celebrating and you don't see the orchestrator, Joe Dumars. And maybe he just has bad feelings right now and he's not over it just yet, but you do believe at some point, you hope, that the Pistons and Joe Dumars can reunite. Maybe the opening night of the new arena and the Pistons playing, you can have Joe Dumars be honored. But it is sad because he built it. He built it. So he does get credit for that. I wonder if maybe he's upset with the fans because they they became malicious and vicious towards him and they would call for his firing. And maybe he feels like a, a lack of loyalty and a, a lack of respect of what he did. But, hey, I'm going to look at it like this and I'm going to say this. He will always be remembered for constructing that team but at the same time, he'll also be remembered for some, some really awful draft picks towards the end of his tenure. He was an okay GM, not a great GM. He was an okay GM, put together a group of malcontents that formed and gelled and became the 2004 going to work Pistons. The last team to win an NBA championship without a true NBA superstar, he orchestrated that. Now, he orchestrated also the early deconstruction of the Pistons that wasn't the greatest deconstruction that led to a long term rebuild. And that's on him. So we got to blame him for that as well as give him credit for what he did in building that team to win that championship in 04 and to give it a shot to win back-to-back NBA championships in 04 and 05 that would have been. 
Also, another note with Joe Dumars. He's at Pistons great, so not only does it look bad and is it upsetting because of, well, he, him just not being there because he orchestrated the team that won in 04, which was the first time the Pistons won after the Bad Boys, teams of 89 and 90. But also, he was a member, a, a very integral, vital member of the 89 and 90 championship squads of the Pistons. The Pistons would not have won uh, both, at least, if either of those NBA titles without Joe Dumars being a vital member of the backcourt with Isaiah Thomas in 89 and 90. So also that's, I think, lost in translation or not taken into account nearly enough either, is that he was a vital member of those teams and also is an NBA Hall of Famer and a guy that won, that means as a player and as a front office executive. How many guys can we name out that really have done that? Not many in NBA history have done that, being a player to win it all as a vital member of a team and actually teams, two teams that means, you know, for Joe Dumars that won it all, but also as a vital member of the front office of a team that won it all. You can't say that about too many guys in NBA history. You can say that about one Joe Dumars, though. And that's why it's disappointing and upsetting even more with that being said, Doc. Hey, it is what it is. I'm sure the invitation was extended. There's no way that it wasn't. And maybe he's just out of town, doesn't want to make the trip in. He said he was out of town, right? He said he was out of town, man. So it is what it is. The Pistons' legacy will always include Joe Dumars. That is a fact. All right, let's take a quick time out, regroup here, get our liquids in us, and then regroup and finish out this podcast with the second half. What do we got on tap for the second half of this podcast? We have to talk about eating some poonchkis. Are you a fan? I see you. No offense to you, Doc, but I see you as a fan of eating some poonchkis. So we'll talk about that in Fat Tuesday and Lent. The Lenten season is kicking off as well, or did this past week. We'll talk about all of that in the second half of this Too Bad Ombre's podcast. Doc here. For the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, thank you for your continued support and allowing us to keep the studio lights on, the microphones hot here at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. If you like what you're listening to, you like the variety of podcasts that you hear, definitely check out our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. That's the easiest way to support us. You get all the news from the network. You can check out the work from Vito, myself, all the guys that are putting out great content almost each and every day. And hey, If you're prone to shop online, click through that Amazon banner, go about your business, shop, and then when you're on that Amazon page, just bookmark it. Anytime at all that you make an online purchase, it kicks us back a little something and helps us keep this project going. We've been going strong since 2013, and that's been largely due to the support of our supporters, and we greatly appreciate it. DetroitSportsPodcast.com. And welcome back to episode number nine of Too Bad Hombres. Now, Vito, do we have to have studio training for you? Seriously, you couldn't get your cans on. I I know, I am struggling there a little bit. When you do interviews, you still don't have the proper mic Well, I want to do the mic, however, I want to place the mic. Why would you do that? I know I don't listen to you, and I should, because it would help me out a little bit. I was just waiting for your guest on the previous podcast to be like, I can't hear you. He didn't once. Oh, did he? Did not. I'm saying did not. So. Which you marked, right? You you saw or heard as well, which was good. A good sign from our guests because typically the guests don't like listening to me or they cut me off because they can't hear me and then it leads to disarray at times. But we always get the ship back on the right track and we'll do that here to episode number nine of Two Bad Hombres by talking about some poonchkis too, okay? I'm not a fan, Vito, and I take insults to Did the Did you fact- hear? Yes, I'm sorry for what I said before the break. I'm not a guy that likes poonchies. One, the calories on those things makes it so that you probably, if you eat, I saw a contest earlier in the week where people are trying to eat two, three, four of those things. Heck no, man. I, I can't get my calories from sugar that much. Um, my sweets are ice cream and maybe ice cream sandwiches, maybe some like Werther's or uh, Werther's. Jolly, Jolly Ranchers. Werther's. What are, what are they? Those Am are the, car- too young? The, the caramel candies. Oh, they're really good. Okay. Bro. Really good stuff. So for me, I'm not a Punchki fan. Um, for Fat Tuesday, I did record an earlier podcast with somebody else, and I, I went and got Middle Eastern food. I got uh, meat pies and cheese pies, and we had a good old time. But for me, I don't celebrate the Polish way, man. I celebrate, as always, the Middle Eastern way, which is the number one way. So Oh, always the number one way, huh? The Mediterranean way <laughs> is the way to be. It's a healthier way, too. A healthier way to eating, keeping yourself trim and proper, all that good stuff, and you know, as we were talking there, you were talking. I was listening. I was listening, actually. I hope you listen to me, too. Well, you try to. 80% of the time. 85% of the time for me, so I think Good. a little bit up. But I was going to say that, hey, you know what? If Rip Hamilton won't put a punch key into his body, into his diet, then why am I going to do it? Rip Hamilton, this guy that was a model for fitness. I mean, look at the guy still in great shape. So I want to keep myself in great shape. So realistically, too, 
in the past, I've never really gotten into poonskis. I've never really gotten into donuts. I like desserts. I like ice cream myself. And actually, that's my preferred, I guess, dessert, I should say. And I also like this cake from Costco. And I'll tell you guys all right now, that's like, it's got this nice cream filling. I love that cake. Like the right icing, the right filling. It's not too heavy on either. But their icing is really good. And I'm not an icing guy for my cakes, but man, they really do it right. Really right at Costco. So hey, a big time uh, pub there. For Costco, maybe they can sponsor this podcast or somebody can sponsor this podcast in the very near future. We're looking for that. But anyways, you brought up Fat Tuesday, too. That's really um, the tradition is eating poonskis. You know, that's part of the Fat Tuesday tradition and for Polish people. It's a Polish tradition. And, you know, Fat Tuesday is the day before the Catholic feast day of Ash Wednesday, which heralds the start of the Lenten season. And Lent for Catholics like myself, is a season to prepare for Easter and marks a time of sacrifice and fasting. And according to MLive, Fat Tuesday started with these unchkis because it was a last chance to use up all the products that might not be enjoyed during Lent. So with all that being said, here's another little factoid for all of you guys out there, including yourself, Doc. Michigan is home to the third largest population of Polish people in the U.S., behind New York and Chicago. It seems like New York always has people from all descents, you know, on the highest total or third highest or fifth highest. Chicago is right behind New York a lot too. Or at number one, number two, number three, wherever it may be in the top five, it seems like those cities always dominate with people of all descents. Well, Michigan, once again, is home to the third highest population of people of Polish descent. So I guess we're a fat population in Michigan too. And we love our Fat Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one of those things, Vito, where, you know, people definitely buy them in dozens and they love them. They're different varieties, you know, cream filled, whatever fillings they got there, apple fillings, all these all these kind of things to make people fat. And, uh, hey, I married a Polish woman, so it's one of those things where you go and you say, hey, if you're a fit person, maybe indulge in one or two. But for me, I can't because, you know, I'm not trying to get myself <laughs> diabetes. I'm not trying to spend you, – when you start working out and you realize – that and you start tying into how much time you got to spend running around to how much food you're eating damn near you'd have to, I'd have to spend 45 minutes on the elliptical to burn off one of those punchkis and when I go work out for 45 minutes I'm exhausted I'm tired I'm one of those I'm one of those people that I, the hardest thing for me to do is actually walk into the gym so I got to get myself and then it's really a bad feeling when you go to the doctor and then you, you see the terrible numbers and you're like, the doctor's like, you got to cut down the fat. You got to cut down the pop. You got to cut down this. Your blood pressure is a borderline. You're like, God darn it. You can't eat what I, I'm damn only 38 years old. I want to have a good old time and eat, but I'm not one of those people that can just eat whatever I want. I got a buddy though. I feel like I've lived a lifetime. Do I know him? I know the name I bet. Yeah. Phil, my buddy, Phil. I got oh, a buddy. Maybe not, but anyway. <laughs> I got a buddy, Phil, that can eat literally, you know, a whole meal will go out and have a whole other meal, and still gains zero pounds. So it's unbelievable. Lucky metabolism. Once you get older, once you get to about 38 when you're an old man like yourself, now the metabolism really, it clocks out on you, huh? It stops all of a sudden. But you still look all right, and I'm glad you listen to the doctor, take heed to his advice or her advice a little bit, and maybe you just need to a little bit more. But cutting down on the calories is always key, and cutting down on pop, those empty calories, that's like the best thing you can do. So a poonchki is not great for a person of any stature, of any height, weight, whatever you want to call it. Because even for me, I can't just eat a ton of poonchkis uh, or a poonchkis one day and expect not to gain any weight from it or to have like high blood pressure and sugar levels all of a sudden. And I know for you, if you're looking to avoid diabetes, well, you probably don't want to eat a poonchki or too many. You know, you said yourself, if you're fit, I guess maybe you want to indulge. If you really like this kind of dessert food, you know, the donut variety, if you really get into that, well, go and indulge in one or two on Fat Tuesday before Lent, because once Lent hits two for Catholics, you you're not you going to eat any. I haven't had? had probably more than five in my lifetime, and I haven't had any. This year will not have one. They are good, though. They really are. I mean, you can have, like, raspberry, uh, custard filling. I mean, they're a good donut. So if you really like desserts, like donuts, you're going to like the punchki. There's no doubt about that. So I got to give credit to the Polish people for that, for starting this tradition. So even though we don't like it, no offense to them for loving Fat Tuesday and that punchki. Mm, okay, Vito, you're in good shape too, though. So I noticed that you handle portion control pretty well, and I'm proud of you. When we go out to eat, you eat healthy, you order the salads, and I'm like, oh, what the hell is he eating? Man? He eats like a girl. <laughs> I do. Uh, I'll get that at times because I don't eat enough meat. You know, the man's meal or that... Just uh, beef and like steak. And my friends, they love steak. They get into it. 
I'll indulge in that once in a while. But the thing is, like too much red meat, they say, is bad for you, for your diet. So I'm trying to live a healthy lifestyle now. And you can save money by doing that, too, by buying the salad. So I view it in that fashion, too, Doc. So you can save some money, but you don't need to. You're the doc. You're the pod father. You're like a multimillionaire oh, of this you. podcast network. Thank you very or much. Or almost there. We'll be there one The day. IRS doesn't know that, so let's keep that under, <laughs> let's keep that under wraps. All right. So with the Poonchki, before we move to the next topic that I know you're interested in, did you see the ridiculous... A Coney hot dog in between two uh, Poonchki. I was like, oh my gosh, that's like a heart attack on a stick. And then you see the commercials now for the Grande Big Mac, extra meat, more meat. There are some hamburgers out there with like four patties, cheese, bacon. I've never really indulged in those like fat burgers or something that monstrous. I think the largest I would say maybe I've tried is I took a bite out of a double Whopper, but that was it. So You didn't eat the full thing. Come on. Do you the Admit the truth right now. Nope. Come clean. Nope. Couldn't, couldn't do it. I, I bought it. I thought I could do it, but I just couldn't do it. I was like, ah, I made a bad choice and just put it down. But, uh, you know, for me, you know, in my current health situation, I got to do the Whopper Juniors and the Big Mac Juniors. <laughs> or maybe neither Junior. Neither. No avoid Big Mac, no Whopper. Avoid, avoid it, all. it all. At all costs, too. And avoid the punch key as well. I think that's a wise thing to say to you. And I think to a lot of people, unless you're of the Polish and really get into Donuts and I'm you feel you're healthy. And I'm reading on Twitter that it was a hit for American Coney Island, that people loved I it. I saw that. Yeah, you know what? To piggyback on that, God, that was sickening to see that. I saw that, actually, the pictures of it. My God, who is going to invest their time in that and indulge in the entirety of one of those? I mean, how fattening, sickening. That's diabetes waiting to happen, or a heart attack, at least, maybe waiting to happen. And it doesn't matter how old you are. That's a heart attack potentially waiting to happen. I want to live a little bit longer than what that might cause me to live until, which isn't that long. And you know what? It's all in fun at times, too. And these restaurants like American Coney Island and others just want to try something new that nobody else has tried before. So it's a great original concept. And even the Big Mac is, the Whopper is. And I like the idea of the junior Big Mac, of the that extra large version of it, too. And then you got the regular Big Mac in the middle, which is big enough and grand enough in calories that, uh, that anybody needs, truly, in their daily diet. So that's a tasty treat, though, too, the Big Mac. I got to admit, I have had a Big Mac or two in my day. Just not too many, and that's why I look the way that I do, I think. I'm not wearing too many Big Macs on me in my weight, in my body from the past. And I don't look into that as like something like enticing to me either. I don't know. Well, you already said it. You don't really get enticed by that either, how these monster burgers or even the Whopper or the Big Mac. And that's good. More power to you. Try not to, man. I've had my share of fast food trying to do the whole Subway thing, sandwiches, but I got to cut that out too because, you know, obviously the salt content. I was going to say, that's bad for the diet too. Too much salt. So I'm at the phase now where it's got to be like, hey, eat a little better, use the Mrs. Dash, use the alternatives, and uh, try and stick around as long as humanly possible. But I did, you know, in my other work, kind of hear a great thing is that I'm here for a good time, not a long time. And that's a great, ph- I was like, oh man, if you don't have kids, that's a great philosophy. You want to live according uh, to that ph- philosophy, but now you can't, right, with the kids, too. No, you can't, but uh, what an interesting philosophy. I'm here for a good time, not a long time. And so, you know, it, life is short when you see the passing, you know, and DSP definitely sends condolences to the Fox 2 family. Ron Savage passed away, you know, it's, uh, suddenly, and everyone that's talked about him, well, I didn't know him personally, and I don't watch a lot of news nowadays, but everyone that talked about him obviously had great respect for him. But you got to realize life is short. So that's why I love this project. You go balls to the wall, have a good old time with it. And it's one of those situations and you have to look at it and say that life is short. Enjoy everything that you do and go balls to the wall. And we do that. And Balls to the wall. I love that wall. saying. And we live great lives. Hopefully it'll be long lives for the two of us. And you said really quick, Andrea, you said your wife, is of Polish descent. She's of Polish descent. and uh, Does she very, like Poonchkis? I'm thankful every day that I married her. Good. I'm glad you got that in a little bit so she can hear that. And you'll be out of the doghouse. But you're never in the doghouse, like you said, on a previous edition of Too Bad Hombres. No, I want to do a quick hitter, I want to do a quick yes. hitter um, before we get to the topic. Ahead. Well, Andrea, does she like Poonchkis, though? We haven't gotten in a while. I, don't, I think she's, uh, after the kids, same thing, fitness. We're trying to live better lives. But Adrian Peterson's not going to be with the Vikings anymore. He's going to be a free agent. They turned down, a, yeah, that extension. No way you pay that money for that extension. I think the majority of our fans on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast, were like, heck no, heck no. Do not even inquire about anybody in their 30s for a running back. Not Jamal Charles, not Adrian Peterson. So I take it you're probably in lockstep with everybody. No on Adrian Peterson. No on AP. No. Can't run any more officially. No big yardage totals per carry either. He's not a guy you want right now because he's not in his prime anymore, too. 
Okay, very good. So hit me with the last topic on this very podcast. What are you interested in, bro? Well, we talked about eating poonchkis, and I think a guy that people, a large actually portion of the country, wants to see eat a poonchki and have some negative results or effects from it is President Donald Trump. They want to see what a poonchki would do to him. And George W. Bush spoke out for the first time in a very long time, never spoke during Obama's presidency about Obama and about Obama being this or that and being a bad president or having bad policies and decisions made. He came out on Today during a Today exclusive with Matt Lauer of the Today Show and spoke unglowingly of Donald J. Trump, our current president. And in this exclusive, George W. had to say the following. I consider the media to be indispensable to democracy. We need an independent media to hold people like me to account. Power can be very addictive and can be corrosive. And it's important for the media to call to account people who abuse their power, whether it be here or elsewhere. Uh, I think we know who he was talking about. He was attacking the man that has labeled the mainstream media as the enemy of the American people. How destructive is that statement in itself? Saying that the media is the enemy of the American people. You know, he's calling out you and I both. You're a member of the media now, so I know you love Trump, or you don't, you don't mind him. You know, I do mind him. You don't mind him. But he's calling us the enemy of the American people. Are they, we really that? They, Come on. Listen, Vito, you cannot be naive to what people think. Athletes view media as being the enemy. And they're corrupt, too. They're not thinking the right way, either. I'm not going to defend them just because I like athletes. I like sports. Wait, I might man. like you. I might love an athlete like, like Justin Verlander, Miguel listen, Cabrera. We cannot be naive to the issue, and here's what it is. Donald Trump is not eloquently speaking on what the real issue is, okay? What he's saying is, is that I'm not in favor of the slanted perception of the facts, okay? And no, I know facts are facts, but in essence, you would agree, don't you think, that MSNBC, CNN tend to lean left? And then Fox News tends, they, they, they say they're fair and balanced, but they tend— Tens, yeah, there's no tens, right? They tend to lean right, so yep. it's pretty obvious, okay? And so— th- I think Donald Trump needs to say, I'm in search of, and I'm in favor of a thousand percent objective media. That's all he needs to say. You're right. You cannot say that media is the enemy of the people. But what he's trying to say is the media can and has slanted some stories in ways that have affected. And now here's a perfect example. Terrell Owens, right? He did a full hour long interview with this young kid and it was great. It was on channel seven on a midnight on WXYZ. And this kid felt so guilty because he said, he was he interviewed T.O. when he was doing that whole setup thing, and he was kind of talking about some issues with Donovan McNabb when he was in Philadelphia. And the kid was so apologetic. He said, you know what? I did this interview with you, and we did it for an hour. But we only cut the five-minute part where it was controversial on ESPN and aired it. And he said, I felt so bad about what I did. It skewed you, and it started the negative perception of you. And then eight years later, Terrell Owens sat with him again, and he said, now this is my show. I'm going to control it, and I'm going to air out the entire length of this interview so everybody knows the proper context. Now, yes, people say things, but you can edit it in a way that takes it out of context. So, And we do it here on the podcast. We edit stuff and things like that. So we, we don't maliciously try and harm people with it, but there are scenarios and there are snippets of information. and. For me, I don't say I don't trust the media, but I'm well aware of things that are slanted in a certain way. So for me, there is no such thing as objective media. So Donald Trump is saying the wrong thing, but I understand his point. And that's why if you look at polls, people don't trust the media. Why? Because all he's got to do is point to the fact that, hey, I'm sitting here and nobody believed it. Nobody thought that I realistically had a chance. They made jokes about it. They started going poll after poll after poll. All he's got to say and point out is, how come the majority of media did not know that there was this strong undercurrent of hardworking people that wanted me in office? How come that happened? Don't you feel a little bit misled? Because they told you a story, but it wasn't maybe as objective as it needed to be. They reported facts. They reported that there was strong support for Hillary. They reported on these things. But if you looked at the coverage the last 10 days, it was all about that they replayed, CNN replayed that video of him making those horrible comments damn near 500,000 times, okay? So what he's saying is wrong. The media's there. They're going to cover you. But what he's got to start saying is we need more objective media from all sides. Fox News needs to be a little bit more objective, and CNN needs to be more objective. And you want to know why? When you look at CNN's coverage, right, and they got the one or two people from the right, and they got four people, the ratio is not right. The ratio is not fair, you know, Fox News tries to at least have a one-to-one ratio and tries really? to— Really? They're slanted. Of course they're slanted. I haven't seen that on Fox News. They don't have, like, the, the all the eight people in the box talking, so they— Oh, they, they don't have the big studio no, crew. No, they don't do all that. 
So what I would say is Donald Trump needs to stop saying the media is the enemy. And what we need more out of out of the media, and like in, in life in general, uh, media can do better, and media can go out there and go get real information. Because Donald Trump has policies, but if you watch CNN, you wouldn't think he made one move that was anywhere near correct. I'm not saying all his moves are terrible. I'm not saying all his moves are wrong. I'm not saying all his moves are actually correct. But what I'm saying is I do believe that there is a little bit of bias in media, and, and it's obvious. It's evident. But he's called out CNN as fake news, and CNN empowered him. He rose to power because of CNN, and he attacks CNN now as fake news. How is CNN fake yeah, news, by the way? How are some of those outlets that he's called fake news fake news? Come on. Yeah, this see, makes no sense. It looks bad for Donald Trump. It's, it's, again, a situation where they've taken the word fake news and twisted it. Fake news is what – the real meaning of fake news was these actual fake websites that would throw out these outlandish quotes like Donald Trump supports Islamic terrorists. You know, and then people would like pick make stories that looked real, but they were actually made up stories. So he took that and twisted it. Fake news doesn't mean that. Fake news is totally lies and totally outlandish type things for entertainment purposes. But what he's saying is bias. He's got to repeat the word biased, biased, biased. If he wants it to hit home, he needs to say the media is not objective because it's not. And it, and and I understand it. I understand you're trying to appease it, but he needs to stop saying fake news and the media is the enemy. He needs to start saying biased and objective. If he says those things, I think people will more people will garner favor for what he's saying because all now he's doing is even people on Fox News are saying stop saying that the media is because you're hurting us. You're hurting the people at Fox News because we don't get credibility when you keep saying the media is the enemy. The media is not the enemy. There people are supposed to ask questions. I would have no problem with it, and they damn near have to shut off the lights if I was doing press conferences because I'd go into a thousand times more detail than I needed to. But he needs to start saying the word bias, and the media needs to be more objective, which they're not. They're not objective. And by him calling out the media as fake news at times, or now literally as the enemy of the American people, he's losing credibility as well as the president of the United States. No doubt about it. Sorry, he is. There's no question with that. And it's more about his policies, his decisions, and what they are. But man, he is losing favor with the American population. How do you know that? Well, look at the numbers, his disapproval rate. His disapproval is higher right now than his approval rate. So his approval rate as a president is what now? It's sky, not sky high. It's cement low, basement low. It's in the basement, in the dumps, his approval rating right now as president. And he's been in office uh, since January 20th, officially was inaugurated on January 20th. So think about that too. For less than a month and a half, he's been the U.S. president. And look at his approval rating, where it is right now. Ratings, Vito? You're, You're telling me that these ratings are accurate and real? You believe every poll now that, dude, Vito, I haven't looked at a poll. There's a election. reason There's a look, reason why he didn't win the popular vote. Remember how everything was skewed with that because Vito, people, Vito. people said Hillary would win. Well, she won the popular vote still. So just remember that. Vito, the polling system is bunk. It's everything, real. that can be flawed. It might be flawed. It's, okay? Because he won, he won the presidency. But remember, the flawed. popular vote is really what that judges. Those polls beforehand that polled... Hillary Clinton as the winner, remember, had her as the clear-cut winner. Well, she still won pretty outstandingly Vito. or lavishly. She won by a big amount. So remember that in the popular vote. Vito. I know Trump won the presidency, but remember that, that she won the popular vote. And that's what those polls really were judging. Oh, good. But uh, in essence, Just saying. you still misled the people. In essence, here's what needed to happen. There needed to be more awareness of this grassroots movement that Donald Trump arose and got awoken. And if Donald Trump... Well, if the election was to go out and get the popular vote, he said it. I'd just go to California and campaign. I'd, I'd campaign more. What he did was he followed orders of Kellyanne Conway, who ran a perfect strategy for him. And everyone said, oh, you need all this to happen? She made it happen. So he went and campaigned in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania. He went through the Midwest corridor and bada boom, he worked the strategy. So, you know, when you look at what's going on, I say the number one thing that you need to do is stop trusting polls. Because guess what? 100% of the polls love me. So that, I haven't seen that uh, be oh, proven as true. I can show you a poll because I'll go right there. Those spam bots on Twitter will <laughs> love you and will show you yes, they their do. love. The thing is, too, with fake news, really quick, by the way, you should be able to tell if you're educated. I know not everybody is enough, but you should be able to tell like on Facebook. Because that's where it really escalates, on Facebook, on a social media outlet like that. Or on Twitter, these fake news outlets sharing stories. You can tell by looking at the headlines at times or by clicking on the articles when you read into the articles and probably – only past the first or second line, the first or second paragraph, let's say, you can tell those stories are fake and that there's no credibility to them. There's no relevance to them. 
So you should be able to tell as well, and you should just know not to believe everything that you read on Facebook or a social media outlet, even like Twitter. So remember that. Take that into account. People have to, you know, wise it up, become wise smarter. Up. They really have to, because if they don't, they're going to continue to be fooled and continue as well to be fooled by Donald Trump and the stuff coming out of his behind. Truly, that is non-factual and an alternative fact. Once again, is not a reality. Is not a fact to it. It's not. It's not factual. You can't take everything from him because of that as being fact. Just remember that as well. Remember what he's saying right now about the reason why he lost the popular vote by so much. He's still talking about that. Even though he's in the White House, he won the presidential election, beat Hillary Clinton with the electoral vote. He is using that, the count which he lost by in the popular vote and saying that that is based upon illegals and on people that are deceased. He's blaming that discrepancy or that big difference in votes of his popular vote total to Hillary's on that. Still going to that. And there's nothing to prove that as factual, by the way, either. That it was because of illegals, because of deceased people. So remember that as well. And we all know about the Russian hacking, too, with the election now. Which is coming more to... Well, it's becoming more vivid. You know? And it sounds more and more valid by the day as well. And it's hard to spin that for Trump and his administration now in a fashion that really avoids all of that talk. Or that allows that stuff to kind of be hidden. And, you know, thrown to the wayside. So there's just so much stuff we can talk about. And, hey, the media can be slanted in one direction, can be biased because of that in one direction as well. At times, it can be. And we've seen that now where at least NBA players and a member of the Golden State Warriors not like what has been talked about regarding him from the media. And JaVel McGee having this now Twitter feud with Shaquille O'Neal from inside the NBA on TNT Shaq's a member of the crew, and he's had this long-standing beef and Let kind of... Let's start reading them, bro. They're hilarious. They are hilarious. It's a funny skit he does as part of Shacking a Fool on Inside the NBA on TNT. I love it. And I think McGee has to grow up here maybe a little bit, you know? Ooh. Maybe man up a little bit and just take it for what it's worth. That Remember, Shaq is doing a segment that is for attention, too, remember? They're trying to get ratings at Inside the NBA. And Shacking a Fool is a funny bit. So take it as being a funny thing, and I know it's harsh what he's been saying about you, but him just mentioning you, an NBA Hall of Famer like that, Shaquille O'Neal, one of the greatest players in NBA history, just mentioning you, uh, I would take that as almost an honor for me. If he's mentioning me, even though he's slamming me, I would just take it for what it's worth and just, hey, let it go in one ear and out the other. And remember that it is a funny bit, once again, that he's doing this through as part of that shacking a fool. No, the tweets are hilarious. If you pull them up, I mean, literally, it's kind of like uh, JaVel McGee is saying that, you know, you've had my, you, my uh, you know, certain private parts in your mouth for so long. I saw that one. And then the ones where, you know, Shaq's like, listen, boy, don't get involved. KD got involved. Yes. The tweets, go look at Shaq's and JaVel McGee's Twitter timelines. It is unbelievable. Wow. What kind of stuff were, were written about? Wow. And this is a really good time to bring up Vito's bad, bad tweet of the week on Two Bad Hombres. As JaVel McGee, as you kind of already mentioned, Doc, he mentioned Shaq in a tweet and then said, get my nuts <laughs> with the, um, the image of a peanut. Get my nuts out of your mouth. And E-A-D, that is all. Hashtag that is all. Mm-hmm. And then Shaq responded to JaVel McGee and said, now, since you're on a good team, you want to act like you a player. Now stop it. You will only be remembered for shacking a fool. Hashtag bum ass. Wow. <laughs> Getting yeah. heated there between JaVel McGee and Shaquille yeah. O'Neal. And you got to take Shaq's side a little bit, maybe a little bit harsh, but it's all in good fun. Supposed to be as part of shacking a fool, a funny segment that I know makes fun of players and maybe erroneously or too harshly at times, as in the case of JaVel McGee. But like I said, grow some thick skin. Grow a pair of nuts yourself. Actually have a pair of nuts and just let it go by the wayside, all this stuff. Remember, it's a part of a segment, once again, that is meant to enhance the ratings. Remember, for Inside the NBA on TNT. If McGee could just understand that a little bit more, maybe this wouldn't have, you know, blown up as much as it has. And then, after Shaq, by the way, called JaVale McGee a bum ass, McGee responded and said, oh, we threatening people now. Kick rocks, you old bastard. Bastard, yeah, it was used. You ain't going to do SH and you know what else follows. And that's on my mama. Stick to, he used the C-O-O-N-I-N-G word. You can uh, say what that is. I just spelled it out for you. You know what 
I just said. Wow. They're referencing that tweet from JaVel McGee. So it got really, really ugly. And then he followed up with another tweet of his own, JaVel McGee, that is saying, forget being on a good team. I'm a grown man. You've had these nuts once again in your mouth for five to six years now. You thought I was just going to stay silent. And then he said, all right, y'all, I'm done responding. I think, I think is what he said there to end the conversation. At least, well, for the time being that I see another tweet from Shaq. So I think McGee wanted to say, hey, we're done with this. Then Shaq did send out another tweet. America, meet Javel, bum, McGee. I mean, using bum, bum ass. And then for Javel to say, stop your C-O-O-N-I-N-G. I mean, it got pretty, it got brought to a another level, a level that it should not have been brought to. But still, for the most part, meant and good fun from Shaq's end, especially. And uh, I should have been perceived that way, maybe a little bit more by JaVel McGee, who allowed Shaq to get under his skin big time. And like you said, KD, Kevin Durant, that is, came to the defense of McGee as well. And he mentioned Shaq's, remember, career as a cop, I believe as a failed cop, and because that didn't last for Shaq. KD said, I didn't know cops could threaten civilians like that. So he was taking it out on Shaq, and calling to the carpet his failed cop career there. Obviously, uh, talking about Shaq, without mentioning Shaq. This was a direct quote, remember, from the media. He gave to the media when talking about JaVel McGee and McGee's Twitter exchange with Shaq. So some pointed shots in the direction of Shaquille O'Neal. And not just from well, maybe a bum NBA player, as Shaq referred to him as, in JaVel McGee, but from an NBA superstar, one of the greatest players, I think, by the end of his career that will have ever played the game of basketball in Kevin Durant. So with Durant taking shots pointed shots at Shaq, it tells you more, it brings more, I guess, credibility to this ongoing argument between McGee and Shaq. And then you saw even Steve Kerr kind of call out Turner Sports as a whole, you know, the inside the NBA crew. And they want to see Durant and Kerr, they want to see Turner Sports kind of take back their criticism or tone it down at least a little bit. And Turner Sports and what they do, and as a media member, uh, media entity, you know what? They don't have to take back anything. They don't have to lessen any kind of a blow that they've sent McGee's way. They can keep it up and keep going as harshly as they want because they are a member of the media with free speech included, obviously, with that being said. So I just don't like seeing you calling somebody, well, probably using bum ass wasn't totally necessary and using some of the language that JaVel McGee used. But remember, we got to take this for what it's worth. It is just a Twitter feud, and as long as it stays that way and doesn't escalate to anything further, then I think we should all be fine with what has ensued, what potentially will ensue going further as well. But wanted to get from you really quick regarding all of these tweets that form Vito's bad, bad tweet of the week. Wanted to ask you, Doc, for your opinion on the Warriors saying that Turner Sports and Inside the NBA, specifically in Shaq from that show, should tone down their criticism of JaVale McGee. What do you think? See, Should they? See, or do you kind of like what's going on or think it's at least acceptable? We're talking, what's going about, on? we're talking about in the media, you got to bring attention to yourself. Unfortunately, it's the name of the game. You have to say things. You have to do things. Is he trolling around? No, but does he really believe this? I, I think that uh, a guy like Shaq probably is above this kind of thing. You have respect. You've won a title. You're on the television, but... In this day and age, with social media, with, with the attention that you get with Twitter feuds, it's one of those things where you have to do it. And uh, it's unfortunate. It's not something that I try to do is get into too many Twitter beefs, but I'm not against it either because we're talking about it got attention. I, when I saw it, I was like, holy, holy cow, um, JaVel McGee's not backing down. Shaq's not backing down. Here we go. And uh, KD supported his boy, but uh, you know, Shaq dismissed him pretty quick. This ain't your avenue. So, hey, what are you going to do? It's a... Uh, it's one of those things that you see in media nowadays. It's uh, it's fun. It's entertaining. It's what I use Twitter for. But it's not something I do personally. But, hey, it's fun. And, you know, coming to the teammates' defense, to the players' defense, as in, you know, for Steve Kerr, that being one of his players, I get it why they would do that. But the media has the right to attack you in every fashion possible. And remember, once again, it's a part of a segment that is looking for eyes, for ratings. Shacking a Fool is a funny segment, too, that is meant to be in good fun when it goes after a player such as JaVale McGee. The Warriors made it escalate, and McGee responding himself, then Durant coming to McGee's defense, and Steve Kerr coming 
to McGee's defense. And the Warriors as a franchise, by the way, now I had mentioned that they didn't like what was going on from Turner Sports with this segment from Shaq. Well, Turner Sports got a message from the Warriors saying that what was going on, what Shaq was doing, it hurt McGee's reputation being repeatedly mocked. So the Warriors as a franchise came to McGee's defense and reached out to Turner Sports about it, saying that that hurt McGee's reputation by being repeatedly mocked. So you got this NBA franchise even coming out and saying all of this. Well, when, you, you know what? what? You know what Mark Cuban did? Stood as- Mark Cuban got a tweet from Bleacher Report sent away. And yeah, Bleacher Report took it down, right? Took it down. Totally. Doesn't that look bad for a media entity? Come on, exactly. man. Well, Keep it. Well, I now re- I learned something new from this, though. I realized that one of uh, Bleacher Report's parent companies is to call Turner. Turner. You didn't know. See, there's yeah. a reason there. But still, if you said it, own up to your immediate entity. You know, we don't like when athletes shy away from what they say, right? And don't own up to what they say. So as a media entity in Bleacher Report, I don't care if you're owned by Turner Sports. Own up to what you said. Leave it there. Yeah, exactly. Leave but, it there. But unfortunately, video Bleacher Report is beholden to their parent company, and I understand that completely. Which, in essence, what Mark Cuban said was, "I have the ability to squeeze you financially, and I will make it happen. So take it down." And, and when you have that power, you start realizing what power can do and what the power of uh, cashola can do for you. Oh, the power of a, a billionaire. Power yes. of a billionaire. Yeah, a so, guy like that can make it ugly for an entity, no matter what or no matter the amount of money that Turner Sports has, still they have to fear that billionaire owner of the Mavericks, a guy with a lot of influence because of that, maybe doing something and making it hell for Turner Sports. And, hey, maybe he could have, maybe he would have. Now, once again, this Twitter beef between Shaq and JaVale McGee should stay a Twitter feud. That's my last comment about that. A great part of this show was being able to talk about that. And we were able to feature it this week as part of Vito's Bad, Bad tweet of the week and uh you know i think a lasting comment from you and i both doc is that we want to see media you gotta do a better job is what i like to see you gotta do more stand up for what they believe in if they said it own up to it if you tweeted it out keep it on twitter and for these athletes and these billionaire multi-billionaire owners too like mark cuban well if you say it as well you own up to it you keep it on twitter And you know what? A guy like that, Mark Cuban, I'll give him this much. It seems like every single time he calls out somebody, he's going to leave it up there. He wants you to see it. He's not going to just take it down all of a sudden because he got some bad pub as a result of it. So I want to see that in media. Media always taking accountability for their actions. But also, yes, these athletes too. Have you said it? Don't shy away from it. Then after the fact, when the media confronts you about the issue. Just make the point. But hey, money talks and BS walks. and uh, That's a good line. Money talks, Vito, and we haven't come across it, thank goodness. I hope we never do, but you know, maybe a goal will be one day to have a parent company and just uh, <laughs> to be editorialized. Right now, we own all our content. I think nothing's been deleted except for mistakes. You know what Twitter needs? And, and we'll leave it at this. Twitter needs an edit button so bad. I would love that, Doc. Because I make so many mistakes. And you know what my people you are? You can't spell. Yeah, yeah I can't, I can't, I can't <laughs> That's spell. That's an issue. I have when you're tweeting grammar. out you know, stuff fast. You know, with your fingers on your phone, it's even harder to tweet out something in a very eloquent fashion. And we got, with the number of followers we got, we got so many people that are like Twitter police. They're, oh, yeah. They're on me. I mean, oh, I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, so what? You are, you with an apostrophe, you without it, who cares? But our followers do, so I'm trying to do the best that I can. So... But a good podcast. I enjoyed it. Great content. Very good stuff, Vito. I'm proud of you. This week, I didn't have to cut out half of your stuff, so I'm proud of you. Oh, good, because, well, you wish you actually did that. Now, you could, though. You have the editorial control of everybody, so you have the editorial control of yourself as well. How great is that? Isn't that good Still, stuff? though, the Twitter grammar police will still attack you no matter what. And if we're in the wrong, I'm glad that people that are fans are following will let us hear about it. And that's how it should be. When it comes to the media saying something that they should not, and when athletes as well say something that they should not. And hey, also, that principle applies to coaches and to multi billionaire NBA owners such as Mark Cuban and the like. Doc, thank you much. Great talking to you. Great podcast this week on Two Bad Hombres. Maybe next week we'll have a very, very special guest joining us in studio, a world champion boxer. Might be in studio with us for episode number 10 of Two Bad Hombres. Maybe we're going to get in contact with some real bad hombres, not just ones He's that play about a bad out of mama jamma. That's what, is, that's what he is, this guy that I'm not going to bring up the name of, though, this week. So I tease you a little bit. So tune in for that. Episode number 10 next week. And until then, have a great weekend, guys. A great week. And Doc and I will talk to you next week for episode number 10. Goodbye. 
was trying to get an idea. I want them dead presidents. I want to pull up. Head spin. Get it, get it, fly. I got six jobs. I don't get it.